So, Bill, tell me a great story. Well, I thought about that. You know, I had I had a uh, interesting thing happen to me, and it was like life or death. But I never felt so alive in my life. So, as you know, I'm kind of a bike nut, right? And uh, bicycle, bicycle. Yeah, yeah. A lot of my friends I say that are motorcycle, motorcycle, but no, I, I have to work at it. I pedal. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I can relate that that sense of freedom. They can relate to my bicycle story. So. Uh, when I turned 55, I wanted to do something. I didn't want to. I don't want to get old. I didn't want to feel like I'm getting old. And biking always made me feel like I was 15 years old. Probably because once you got a license, you never get back on your bike. You know, for <laughs> so a couple true. of decades. <laughs> so, 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 for, uh, so I had I had built it. By then, I had built up a group of guys that like to do these. You know, day long rides. The biggest thing we had ever done was ride the whole Silver Comet and back, That's double century, good, double in two days. You know, he slept oh. the night and rode run, run 100 miles back. This was the big plan, and I'd never done anything like this. We were going to ride from Pittsburgh to D.C. in four days, about 375 miles. Wow. And it's a beautiful trail, uh, CNO Trail, the Allegheny Passage. It goes right through the Appalachian Mountains, mm. all rails to trail, then a canal trail. George Washington's company built the canal. And it was like it was like he was building an eight track because when he finished, the trains came along and they never even used it, and the thing went for like 150 really? miles. Yeah, that's <laughs> like having an eight track player in the 80s. But anyways, that <laughs> half of you won't understand what I'm talking about. But so we rode, and that was like the best ride of my life. And it was with I invited ten people from every decade of my life, and I ended up getting like you know, maybe a half a dozen and they brought friends and we had about 13 of us and we were the pit 13. Did that ride. The first stop was the most amazing. The first 75 miles, we ended up in a town in Eufaula, Alabama. Not Eufaula, Alabama, you, um, Ohio Pile. Ohio Pile is outside of Pittsburgh, 75 miles. It's where Frank Lloyd Wright uh, designed Falling Waters, one of the best uh, pieces of architecture in American architectural history and just in history in general. But anyways, so with that ride was really cool, and I never forgot it. And and then I go on the link trip with the with all the leaders in Atlanta, which was kind of an honor to be on that. And we go back to Pittsburgh about I don't know five years later, three three or five years later. And, and that group, in the meantime, that group is now wanting to do rides every year. So we've done rides all over. Just like you inspire me, this guy inspired me because he motorcycled. You know the Continental yeah. Divide, right? Yeah. This is my Continental Divide. Yeah, that's awesome. We done, we done, we, but it was more biking, right? right? So, so I go back there. I said, you know, I didn't get to see Frank Lloyd Wright's house. The I'm gonna, water. Yeah, I'm going to take a couple of days off. I'm going to, and I said, you know, I probably know somebody in that link trip that rides bikes, and I'll get somebody to take a couple of days off with me, and we'll do the same ride, spend the night, go see Falling Waters, the next morning, get up, and ride back. Well. Link Trip had a thing you couldn't know who else attended. You couldn't reach out. You just showed up, and there was 100, 120 people from Atlanta. You didn't know, so I couldn't reach out to anybody. And I, and I, you know, it was really weird. Suppose, but I booked it all. I had two tickets to see Falling Waters, and I get there and I end up. And so I thought, oh, maybe I'll just talk somebody into it. I couldn't talk anybody. To just take a couple of days off. Entrepreneurs work that way, I guess. You know, we we work all the time, but when we want to play, we play. So, um, so I did it myself. And I rented a bike, and I'm riding, and it starts storming, and it starts lightning, and my phone goes dead, and it starts getting dark, and it's through the forest, and there's trees, tree trunks as big as your desk. I mean, my, I have a photograph of my bike. My seat is not as high as the thickness of the trunk coming down around me. And the trees are falling? Yeah, and I've got, I'm in the middle of nowhere. I mean, I'm you know, 50 miles outside of Pittsburgh in the country, got another 25 miles to go. And I never felt so alive in my, in my life. And you would have all these trees fall down in front of, you know, in front of me. I didn't like, not right in front of me, but I'd get up to this patch of trees and I'd have to figure out, am I gonna carry, walk, you know, I'm gonna carry my bike over them? Or am I gonna slide under this big branch? And it just fell, I mean, not branch, tree. And I finally made it to, to, Ohio, to Ohio Pile about, I don't know, 10.30. The inn that we had stayed at night? up, yeah, the inn that, that we had stayed up before, it felt like 10:30, maybe it was just the storm of the darkness. I had, and I really never felt, and I've talked to a psychologist soon. There's something about some part of your brain kicked in when you're. I think people in war feel this when they want to go back to the battle. You know, they, because when you're in that life-threatening situation, your brain uh, works at a different level. 
It's just trying to keep you alive and it calms you down. And it's just some different. So there's a, a different. There's a different endorphin going on that I never felt before. And I get some pretty good endorphins riding 70 miles, but this is different. And uh, so I, I got there, but as soon as I got in the in the hotel room, I didn't. I had. I started shaking, shivering, and passed out. I couldn't even go out to eat. I was just it was shaking cold, like I had the fever. And they and what a psychologist had told me, yeah, you were basically in shock. You know, you'd be, your, your brain went into another mode so you could wow. make it through that. And then you were in shock and you just crashed. And I felt fine then, you know, the next day, went and saw falling water, rode back, and it was a very sunny day. And I give credit to everybody that works that trail. All the trees were cleared. I saw some solid, you know, things where I put my, I took the photographs on the way back. One point, there was a, a brown snake coiled like that and you're riding and it's dark and it's just flashing light i rode right over that thing at the last minute i couldn't move and it was, it was this in the middle of the trail but i'll never forget i'll never forget that that night and i haven't really told that story too much but <laughs> you asked me to think of a story that was oh like... my god so <laughs> so the takeaway from that was that I'm crazy. <laughs> well, but you felt the calm in the storm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, all entrepreneurs are risk takers, and you shouldn't, you know, my wife was freaked out about it, doesn't ever want me to ride alone again. But as an entrepreneur, sometimes you're out on the trail alone. Yeah. And, I think you're yeah, on the trail and you, a lot and you alone. Have, and you're really, you know, you face a lot of challenges when you're an entrepreneur or a business, a small business owner. And, that probably is the best thing. You just got to, you know, it's, this is nothing. You know, this is nothing. We'll get through this. You do need to sleep after all. <laughs> but the crash kills me. That's unbelievable that it just this, it just took all of your energy, basically. Yeah, I was, I was shaking, cold and wet because it was raining. And I, I didn't have any energy, and I was fine the next day. Wow. So, hey, everybody, I got my buddy Bill D. St. Alban with me. He uh, runs a company called the Sizemore Group. And Bill and I met back years ago. When some of the people in Alpharetta decided they want to start looking at a new city center, put, making city of Alpharetta a cool place, and Bill was there because he was a land planner, and I, I think I showed up because I was a landowner at the time, and so there was a group of us, and I got to know him, and uh, he's one of the coolest people that I know. And so I wanted to bring him on today and talk about land planning, city planning. What are some of the things that guys like him know that makes cities work and all that kind of stuff. So we're going to spend a little time on that. But before that, we're going to talk about a little bourbon as we like to do. So the first one I want to bring up is Booker's. And so this Booker's is Jim Beam bourbon. And so Booker No was a grandson of Jim Beam. And this is kind of the way that he said his, his grandfather, Jim Beam, liked to drink the bourbon. It's 126 proof. It's basically just open up the keg and pour it. I mean, most most whiskeys are 90, and this is 126. So sometimes you got to put a little water in there to enjoy that. But what's so cool is that Booker knows grandson. So Booker's a great grandson of Jim Bean, and Booker No, who was a distiller, his great grandson. It's called Freddie No. And so Freddie's got his own, and this is called uh, Little Book because that's what his grandfather called him was Little Book. And so this is only like 116 proof. So this is the one we're going to drink today. Thank you. So that we uh, <laughs> so that we can continue having the conversation. But if you're looking for a really good bourbon to give to somebody uh, for a present, it comes in a really cool box and stuff, and it's um, it's not something somebody would normally buy. So, Bill. Talk to me about land planning and um, Sizemore Group. So when are you usually called in? When do you get the call, hey, we need you? What are the kind of things that y'all get? Y'all so we're, we're an interesting architectural firm. There, there are architectural firms that uh, specialize in retail or specialize in multifamily, specialize in hotels, office buildings, you know, and they, they make a pretty good living doing that. And they may do the same building over and over and over for a client. That's not us. Uh, we're, a, we're a planning architecture firm with a capital P. When the, uh, when the Olympics came to Atlanta, they hired us to master plan all 29 venues. So we were the first person design firm hired for the Olympics. That's and, pretty daggum yeah. cool right there. You need that on your business card. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, yeah, actually the that's Olympics what it started here. <laughs> 
Well, and I guess the movement I was attra- I was attracted to that and the and the green space they had master plan Centennial Park. So did you have something to do with that? No, those two things attracted me. There's three things that attracted me at firm 27 years ago. They were planning the Olympics, they master plan Centennial Park, and then they did downtown Smyrna. And downtown Smyrna was the, one of the very early. I mean, think about this. Everybody in town is trying to do what Alpharetta did, right? But all that started back in 93. We did the first vertical mixed-use townhomes or retail above it. That was back in the early 90s. Wow. It won a national award uh, for um, best public-private partnership. And uh, so, it, you know, that those two things said, you know, and I've been working for a firm that did a lot of big projects. And uh, but I but I was also raising a young family with my wife and I wanted to be home more. I didn't want to be on the road. And so I just thought, you know, I think I'll, they've been trying to hire me. I think I'll go join them. And I've been there for 27 years. But the thing I talked to them about is this planning is really important and they were good at it. They're also good architects, but they are pretty not many architects were looking at the planning side like they were. How do we make environments healthier? And, and this all dawned on to me in the 80s. So I'm going to date myself. I was going to Georgia Tech, and my folks, for an investment, bought a condo down in Seaside, Florida. And Seaside wasn't even there. It was Seagrove Beach, still is Seagrove Beach. And my mom, we go down there for vacation. You my, still got it? No, wish we did. <laughs> I heard that stuff's going for 2,000 a square foot. They, they paid $85,000. For a condo that faced the ocean, you just walk down the slope oh into the ocean. God. They sold it for 160. That person sold they, it for they 500. Thought it was, <laughs> they thought it was a smart move, didn't they? But when she sold me this magazine article, what was going to get built down the street? It was seaside, and I said, "Well, shoot, that's how we ought to build our suburbs." It just made sense that you can walk from one thing to the next. You know, just it was just a healthier environment. And I had worked myself through school with civil engineers i'd be looking at all these plans we'd have to take these land plans and do the engineering for them and i just thought they were they were terrible i mean mm-hmm. this is why are people live this way with some product some you know apartment guy that stamped out the same thing forever just laid them all over right. the place put a big retention pond put a fence around the retention pond parking and that's space. how they wanted people to live parking was the cars were taking care of people maybe more. a pool yeah, yeah, exactly. But people were not taken care of. It was not a healthy environment. You could have walked to the store. I mean, this this bourbon, we're going to talk about bourbon planning in a minute, but <laughs> it, it does relate to, to drinking. My, my parents' uh, generation, my grandfather, Irish, uh, his name was Tom O'Brien, liked his whiskey. And he, he was in Chicago. He could walk to a corner store. He didn't harm anybody. He'd walk to a corner store. I mean, not corner store, corner bar. I think that was a big difference when I moved from Chicago to here. I think we had as many corner bars in as Chicago <laughs> as we have ch- churches in the South. In South that's true. That's <laughs> although, although we're fastly catching up with the breweries and stuff. That was quite a while ago. But, but you know, he didn't get in a car because he can walk to everything, right? And so there was no harm done. You could cause a lot of danger if you have too much drinking to get in the car. So, so, so my, my interest has always been how can I improve the environment for people? You know, and 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 not just it's not just about making money. It's about what it, and it turns out you can make pretty good money doing this, but it's really more about how can we make a, a better environment for the for the generations to come. So, do you feel like you specialize? Is that the kind of your specialty? Is planning? Yes, it's the kind of thing. It's gotten to the point where planning. Uh, a lot of architects will, will respond to RFPs. It just comes to us. I'm, I just, I'm just answering the phone or getting called to go to a meeting, and uh, yeah, we've gotten really well known for doing it. And part of it is, I give uh, Alpharetta, it, town planning is not a quick process. You know, you're going to mm. put up a, um, you know, I don't know, a KFC. You're going to do it in a certain amount of days and everything. Building a town, it's going to take 5, 10, 15, 20 sometimes centuries you know right <laughs> and and now i'm at that age where all this stuff i worked on is built and they're like this is really cool it's like, like well, yeah it only took about there it only took about 15 on. years so who's <laughs> calling you is the city's calling you and the county's calling you or is it private people or i yeah i, who's I, give you a, I got some really great clients from both the public and private side um Probably the biggest thing I worked on recently, the city of College Park I had done a plan for them, and they and I said you really need to control the land. 
They assembled 350 acres with a golf course on one. We window. learned that in Alpharetta, didn't we, controlling the yeah, land? Yeah, yeah. If you really want to, if a city really wants to control its future, it's got to buy the land. That's what we did, told them in uh, both Duluth and Smyrna. So, but they assembled a pretty big chunk, and we uh, master plan a $1.5 billion project. Um, and you got the second busiest, we got the world's busiest airport. You got the second largest uh, convention center. And you got Marta and a Main Street uh, down there. You do have planes going pretty close overhead, uh, <laughs> but but in a golf course. So they had a lot going for themselves, and uh, and it it was uh, that's pro. And they called basically the mayor knew me and called me up, and the guy that did the financing, Ed Wall, uh, had been asking me questions for about two years while they were assembling the land. Right. And I just, I was just helping a friend, you know. For free. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't, you know, he'd ask me a question, they, you know, I'd give him some advice. Uh, next, and, and they had, uh, I don't, and don't take this wrong, because there's a lot of great developers out there, but they had been burned by some development in their minds in the past, so they really wanted to come up with their own plan and control the destiny of their city. On the other side, so that's a private, that's a public, public sector client. Um, but you know, in the end, nothing gets happens unless you align with the private sector. It's both of them. You have got to it. Work you together, have right? to work together. That's what I that's say. Key. <laughs> that's key. They have to work together. Yeah. And in the faster uh, monies from the private sector, private sector. So what would be an example of a private sector deal? Well, so right now I've got I um, I was fortunate about a couple of years ago. Uh, Jim Jacoby, who did Atlantic Station, reached out to our firm, and they had two really cool projects. And I said, you know. I, well, they reached me out about one, then they started talking about another one, and uh, it's been about two years in the planning, but they're brand new cities, privately, public-private, uh, there's there's some TAD money, but they're definitely privately let. And one is a, is uh, about 1,000 acres on the Etowah River in uh, Cartersville, the other side of the river mm-hmm. from Cartersville. Really, really cool town. You're going to have a, you know, a performing arts theater in it um it's, it sits right on the river with a little waterfall and it's just really and we're planning the whole town about three thirty five hundred residents will be moving into there um and uh, that that one's pretty cool but then they said hey can you come down to st mary's georgia so i came down to st mary's georgia and they got a hold of an old um and jim's a, an expert at brownfield site so the site in Atlantic Station was a brownfield. He did right. that, right? But Etowah was actually a, an old mining site. Can't even tell how fast the trees grow. The mines, you know, they stopped mining it. There's a hole in the ground? There's some holes and there's some mountains. What, we gonna, what are you going <laughs> to do you, with the holes? What do you make bulldozers for? <laughs> I learned that early on. So, a lot of so are we putting in a ski slope or what are we doing? <laughs> they they like, good. You know, a lot of developers are the kids that played those big yellow trucks in there. <laughs> <laughs> Tonka. Tonka. Yeah. Tonka. Yeah. They don't mind grading. Um, so, um, you know, we try as architects, we try and save every tree, but sometimes to build a place, it's the tree of the future you're worried about, uh, not necessarily the tree that's in the way of a good plan. Mm-hmm. Um, so, anyways. Wait a minute, that's key. <laughs> Do most of the tree guys feel that way in these cities? No, I try and, the trees are a funny thing. We got, we got enough of them in Georgia. In fact, you're going to get me on a tree tangent. I'm going to get my tree red. I'm my not going rant. deep, but, you know, there's a lot of people complaining about trees. Yeah, there is. So there's tree huggers, and it just came up when I master plan uh, downtown uh, Milton, mm-hmm. the city of Milton. There's tree huggers, and, tree, you know, I love trees. They provide, they're the, they're the best thing in the world. They, you know, what we breathe out, they breathe in and give us back, you know, oxygen, what we breathe in, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, you know, our cars pollute stuff, and they just absorb it. So trees are great. Um we have 23 million square feet of uh, 23 million acres of commercial forest in Georgia alone. We can harvest a million. That means we can harvest a million acres in Georgia and never lose an acre of forest because it a pine about every 23 years you can Regrow. harvest it, right? So people don't understand that, and if you don't allow them to harvest that. They'll, t- they'll tear down those forests and make them under use out of it. If they're commercial forests, they're commercially owned. They, right. can, you know, they can do anything with it. Right. So, so you really got to, you got to look at it in terms of the, the big picture. And, um, but, but I thought about this when we were des- designing downtown Crabapple. Um, what was more important to me is that the trees, we got the, we got the density there to make it walkable. We created a little mill village. And that the trees were placed so people would be encouraged to walk, so they tree-lined the streets and the sidewalks. 
Well, a forest isn't going to grow tree line, so you can put houses in between it and right. encourage walking and encourage hiking, which is cool. And you should have. All my plans have kind of little, I call them forest preserves now, right? They're usually uh-huh. where the stream are. You can't build there can't anyway, build right? right? But, but And I love trees, but it's got to be the tree that creates the human environment, not that, you know, we're not, we're not. We're a different kind of animal. What you know, ants create ant hills. What do humans create? And that's what we want to do at nature, in our towns. We want to put the nature that'll create the environment we want. That's I guess that's my tree rant. I could go on one more story. No. So in your opinion, <laughs> basically you got a you got a, a specimen tree, and if you have to take that specimen tree to get the other stuff to work then that's okay because you're probably going to replant trees anyway and yeah. and cover the same amount of whatever yeah. canopy or whatever by planting other trees, right? Yeah, and you should plant trees. Um, in, so, it, But I wouldn't let um, working around an entire, you know, working a town around a whole tree. In fact, there was a, an assignment at Tech. If you couldn't take down it, I should Tech will probably take away my degree for telling you this, but... <laughs> If you couldn't, you had to put a house on a site and they had strategic trees and different issues. And if you couldn't tear down the tree to how, meet the program, you, you failed. <laughs> because they were trying to say, sometimes you got to make tough decisions. And if that's the program for that site, so, you know, I, I actually think my solution did save that tree because I, I just, I'm kind of creative that way. <laughs> but I'm not sure I did really good because I did. Early. <laughs> Okay, so the the city calls you. How does that process work? Hey, we want to do something with this area. What's the ABCs of that? You know, it's usually kind of like a, a an informal education uh, process with me. Um, I won't name the city right now, but the city had called me. A new new mayor's coming in, and he had a he, he had a vision. He ran on a vision, which was really good. Uh, and but he needed the expertise to execute his vision. And we began to talk, and a lot of the things that you think naturally are the problem aren't really the problem. And so you just kind of educate them. You know, they were saying, like, Bill, why, um, you know, traffic's a real problem. And why are, is everybody building these apartments, and why is our retail dying, right? And uh, we need more single family. And... Um, and then you kind of walk through them with them and say, well, you know, one of the reasons traffic is bad is because all you have is single family and you don't have jobs. So that, and your single family is at a price point that the people that work in this town can't live here. So, and I said, I give Alpharetta, we're in Alpharetta, I use Alpharetta as an example, right? So Alpharetta, great city, great city, love Alpharetta. So don't take this wrong. And actually Alpharetta's done, uh, caught on quicker, but when I was studying Alpharetta, they had 100,000 jobs, tech jobs. We got more fiber optics than anywhere but New York City, the side of the Mississippi and Alpharetta. We got more tech jobs in Austin, Texas. I mean, Alpharetta is a happening place. Uh, you know, the fact that you got four intersections on 400 or a long time ago set, the, set a brilliant. positive path, right? That and the fiber optics. Um, but but the, So the economics are good. Lots of because re, really uh, single family homes are usually a burden on the tech. They require more services than the revenue they get for the municipality, but but commercial buildings don't, so that's where they get their money to, to build the parks and do all that. So commercial so, is good for the tax. Money. Oh yeah, so so they so Alpharetta had, had it going, but they had a hundred thousand jobs and a population of forty thousand. And I said, you know, you're missing 60,000 people. And they said, oh, no, that'll kill our traffic. I said, no, how do they get into work? They're already on your road. They might have to drive a shorter distance if you would let them live here, right? right. So they'd be on the road less. So that, that's counterintuitive. That's counterintuitive, you know. And, and so you just kind of kind of educate people on that, right? And Alpharetta has done a lot since then that, to kind of balance that, uh, that kind of uh, jobs so does that mean that one of the important pieces is to have housing for different price points, different types of people? Is that critical? Yeah, if you have different. I mean, you job, need apartments, you and you need Section Eight, and then you need millionaires. I mean, how how do you? Yeah, same thing. I was master planning Dollywood. They wanted a little village, and um, I just looked at them in the be- first meeting and said, "Where do your workers live?" And they were like, well, we don't want them here. They bus in and all that. And I, but but the, one of the senior guys said, you know, Dolly heard you say that. She'd do something about it right away. 
<laughs> so, so it's just it's just little things I bring up to people. But but the other one is, is <laughs> <laughs> you say that kind of tongue in cheek, right? It's like I'm just kind of giving it to you. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, see the. So other, you need all of the different types. Yeah, of you need different types of housing. And you need a network of streets. I mean, Alpharetta's done a great job building this kind of grid and fabric of streets so you can get around. The other reason you have a lot of traffic in the suburbs with all the, the single family homes spread everybody out, so everybody's got to drive farther to work. If you can get your job close to your house, of course, that's better. That's right? a win. That's a win, right? Okay. That's why you see the CIDs are these big like Perimeter Center, Cumberland, all those areas were just like our cities from the 80s. They were just vacated and you know, after five o'clock, nobody was there. Mm -hmm. So we've changed all that because jobs, the housing balance, have, and, and it was illegal to put housing in those areas. So once you allowed housing to go in those areas, uh, people wanted to live closer to work and they changed and traffic actually got better. You might not sense that, but it got better because those people weren't well, driving. We had this they, weren't, and... they weren't driving 20 miles, they were driving a mile. So how long are they on the road? How much traffic are they creating, right? So, but the other piece of it, and we got wrong in the suburbs that I help cities with, is, uh, and it's a hard, this is a hard one, um, is they have, uh, they design in pods. So everybody lives in this pod or that pod, and then there's one street you got to go on to go everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And there's no network, there's no grid. So you don't have an alternative. So everybody's going out to the same street to get to one place. And if you go, in a, you know, commuting most of my life down to Atlanta, once you get inside the perimeter, traffic isn't that bad. It's actually in the burbs it's worse because we have these regional roads we built without a lot of connectivity. And this one's really, I lived on a cul-de-sac, so I understand the attraction of a cul-de-sac, but that's like a private enclave you built for yourself and it doesn't help the general public. It doesn't you give can't an alternative. pass through, you can't take yeah. a shortcut, you can't yeah. change. You can't change, there's no alternative way. When there's a traffic jam, mm -hmm. there's no alternative way because we, we allowed everybody to build these kind of enclaves that have yeah, one way in All these it. subdivisions are dead ends because the builders yeah. think they're good. Yeah, right? and they are. I mean, I lived on one, so I get yeah. it. I get it. But there are alternatives, and it's kind of the cottage court. What if your, your cul-de-sac was didn't have any cars? And it was like a lawn that all the houses faced, right? And you see some of these being built now, and there's a cottage court, and all, these, all the people can kind of face that and hang out with their neighbors drink drink their bourbon yeah right and not ever you know and, and then the car the alley you only build the alley right to get around it or a, or a road to get around it so there, there's different ways to do it where you can get what you're trying to find in a cul-de-sac by the way you plan a neighborhood and we're doing a lot of that right now so actually. when you go into a, a city you got certain things you got to work with right and how do you talk to them about Parks. How do you talk to them about live, work, walk, balance, all that? What, how does that? Is there yeah. a, a percentage or something? I mean, there there are a lot of good rules of thumb, but what we do is uh, we let every uh, city be somewhat uh, unique, and we I always say there's three to any good planning project or any good design project. There's kind of three components, all right? And one of them is analysis. What are the facts? How much green space do you have now? You know, what is your traffic count now? What's your medium income? How many jobs do you have here? You know, all, get all the data you can that it just can't be disputed, although it will be disputed, but you kind of get it and vet through it. Mm -hmm. And those are called the analysis of the facts, which way is the water flowing? You know, just right. all that kind of stuff. Where, where's the crime? I'm getting crime, I get crime status for our studies. You know, where's all the crime happening? Where's all the bike accidents? Where's all the car accidents? And those become hot spots, and you know, that's all just data, and that's really important. And then hmm. the, the second people that the uh, second part that's just as important, probably more important, is the people, right? So you kind of you do all kinds of community interaction until we get what they want. What is your vision? You know, what is your dream for this for this town? So some I got a team that kind of goes through the facts. I got another team that's really good at working with communities. We do all kinds of surveys. The thing we really started doing is showing up, and I, the pandemic's hurt this a little bit, but not too much because we, we turned it virtual pretty quick. But if, like, uh, Alpharetta uh, has got the uh, Songwriters Festival, right? right? So whenever we go into a city, we say, so what are your festivals? Because that's where we want to solicit input. So I would like when we did, uh, we went to... Uh, Pigs and Peaches in Kennesaw. We designed downtown Kennesaw. We've got 60,000 people. The elected officials love it. They never get that much. So our data, 
It's so different. If you have a public meeting and say, we're going to design your town, come on out, we want your input. Who's gonna co- you get two kinds of people that come to that. The geeks like me, you know, that, right. that love this stuff. And the naysayers that don't want anything to happen, right? Right. That's not really the public. That's just yeah. a small group. That's a little bubble of, of two little, you Right, know. that's good info. So, so we go out and try and find out what the real people want, right? And you get a whole different... So how do you do that? All right, so the Biggs and Pete, the one we did, we did one in Stonecrest, <laughs> and we actually set up our design shred in the mall. What is that design shred? Oh, yeah, I got to remember. <laughs> Am I talking in acronym? <laughs> we did do one in Alpharetta. Uh, we, we did, did but I'm trying to help <laughs> other people. Right, right, I've right. seen it. I've so seen design it. shred is, uh, so that's good, because I was, we go back. So there's three, three components. There's the facts. There's the input, and, so, and and part of the facts is market analysis. What what can your area, uh, what will the private sector come and do? Because it's just a darn good thing to do. Look, analyzing your population and your demographics. This is what the market would love to do here. This is what the community would love to do here, and this is what the facts are telling us, right? So how do you we we our job is to find the overlap. The market wants it. The community wants it. The facts support it. There's funding for it. That's another piece. you, you got to have funding. Because yeah, you, you actually could have the people want it and a market for it, and there's no funding. Affordable housing is one of those But things. you know that before you go, so then you don't go. <laughs> yeah. So we want to make sure there's funding, right? There, right? Yeah, yeah. So, but, then, but then we bring it all together in a charrette, and those, they're really important. Um, it's when, and we've done them. Uh, when, we did Dul- when I did Duluth downtown, we had 300 people show up to design their town. And we set up five or six tables. We take them through an exercise, and we sh- we t- well, first we tell them what hey this is what you said did we hear it right you know this is all the survey data we did this is what the analysis is telling us this is what the market study is telling us now let's come out and vision your town you know so it's and and like we have a, a clean... professional at each table you know we we'll have some will be landscape architects some will be transportation some will be our urban planners and our architects and then we collaborate the best thing is to do it over like a three to five day period Mm -hmm. and what happens is you pull up and you present and then you you grab by the end of a five week five day exercise you'll everybody will gravitate towards one solution and it's something that might take years to do or months to do you can do it five days because all the expertise are in the same room there's not like i'm going to one department to one department one department to get some approved the community's in the room because you can't get anything done if the community doesn't want it. They're going to put red flags up. Everybody's there, and it's more like a celebration when you do it. So they're actually going and drawing. Hey, I think a park would be good here. I think <laughs> a road would be good here. I think this would be a good place to put a restaurant. Or what yeah, yeah. Now they'll have they'll have because um, they know their neighborhood better than us. So they'll tell us what issues are, and we'll draw up solutions for them. A lot of times you still need the architect and the engineer, but we'll get their reactions. Yeah, that's what we need to do. Or no, no, don't do you know. So it's a, it's an interactive process, and it's not like sitting in your office visioning up what you think the best town ought to be no it's dirty work you're actually collaborating with people that have opinions you know and so how important is uh what do you call it the the walkways and trails is that the hardscapes is that what up is that what it's called hardscape yeah hardscape it's, you know so it, yeah. some towns don't have that right they got the buildings and they got stuff going on downtown and then some places they got a lot of that stuff in the parks and the walk and the lighting and all I mean, is that critical to have? It's really critical. And it's why? really critical. I mean, it, well, one thing for your health, it's a lot, you know, humans were designed to walk, you know, at least 20 minutes a day. I mean, that's really all you need to do to stay healthy. But we built an environment where that is impossible, you know, for, for those places that don't have it, right? Right. But even when you have it, you have so many temptations in your house with all the technology we have. You really want to make it so it's a joy to go outside and walk. It's a joy to go to the local brewery or something, right? Mm -hmm. So really designing that public space for the pedestrian and now for the cyclist and now for the e-bike and uh, everything else, it's important. And then all the I've got uh, probably five brand new cities I'm working on, and every one of them is talking about we just want to park our car once and get in our electric vehicle <laughs> you know all right so what about so, what about so you can it's not that little sidewalk you say need to be five feet and it may need to be eight feet well it actually may need to be like a street because you got all kinds of vehicles so i so i was talking about the cottage court another way to design a cottage court is you only build the alleys 
and then all the streets actually become not for cars. They're for all those vehicles. But instead of having sidewalk, street, sidewalk, you just have, a, like the belt line, you just have an 18-foot street, but there, there's no cars on it. Your kids can go on it, your scooters can go on it, whatever, your EV vehicle can go on it, but no cars can go on it. And all the houses face that. Instead of facing, you know, their garage so facing another re- garage. Yeah, you re it, yeah. re And you create a park system, basically, a linear In the park front. system. Yeah, that, that connects everything together. That's what I'm doing in two or three developments. Well, you know, you go through old neighborhoods, and they have those little parks and stuff. Oh, on, yeah. They're really important. What, what I like about Alpharetta, when we did, when we planned, well, since we're in Alpharetta, I'll talk about Alpharetta. You know, we did Smyrna, and we did Duluth. It was always about where's the center of town. And I got to Alpharetta, and we're trying to figure out where the great park is, where's the great center of town. And everybody had, everybody was convinced their idea was right. We must have had 10 centers. And, and I stopped and I said, wait a minute, look at Savannah. Why don't we just do a bunch of park? <laughs> yeah. And we did. And, and then I had, uh, this is, you know, this is 2010, right? Or eight, somewhere yeah. around there. And, uh, and I had a friend recently told me, yeah, have you seen Alfred? It's really nice. They got all these little green spaces. I said, yeah, I could tell you when that happened. <laughs> And that worked, right? <laughs> worked. Little green spaces work. Yeah, and it works for your festival. What's too small, what's too big? All right, so this, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Okay. Uh, you know, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm one that's never been afraid of the Grand Park and the j- Grand uh, Gesture, like Olmstead. In fact, I'm reading a lot about, he designed Central Park and a lot of our big parkway systems back in the 1800s. I think he did Piedmont Park. He did. He did. And he was just a big thinker to see way in the future, and you need those kind of environments. But when you get to an urban planner, usually if you're doing like a little mixed-use development, one of my consultants would tell me, and he was a landscape architect, but also he taught at Harvard, got me to help him teach a class in urban retail, a really good expert, Bob Gibbs. And <clears throat> he said, whenever you're working on a town green, draw it up to you think it's just the right size, then cut it in half. <laughs> really? Yeah. He says we always overdraw it because you want that intimate feeling. You want to feel like you're in a room. And if he, and then Mike Sizemore probably had even a better, and I, tra- I tra- train people on what Mike trained me. Your eyelid, right? Your eyelid right here, there's a 25-degree angle that hits your eyelid. So if you, if you, can, if you can draw a line and say it's a 100-foot wide green space mm-hmm. and you're six feet up, and the top to get that sense of enclosures, your the top of the buildings have to be a hundred, can't be no more than, um, can't be no less than actually, less than twenty five percent of that hundred. So it would be twenty five feet tall. So when or, you, I, or you lose that sense of enclosure. So when I so I look at it, I feel like I'm enclosed. You feel like you're in an outdoor room. Yeah, my, it feels like vision. a place all of a sudden. You're it's in like a, place. a room. It's an out. It's an outdoor living room. For it's the like city. my back porch. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It is. Right, it's like about, a community porch. All yeah. right, what about cars and parking decks and parking spaces? I, I just feel like we, for a long time, we just created way more parking spaces than we need. We got those formulas the city use. If it's office, you need this many spaces. Retail, this many. What, what's your opinion on all that? How do you, right. how do you figure that out? All right. So I, I think uh, a lot of people are going to say I'm crazy. And I know what council people have to put up with. So I could see where they're coming from and trying to get all these parking rules out because somebody that's got a car parked in front of them will call and bother them. But in, in actuality, I think the government ought to get out of the parking business. Just, you know, just get out of it. Um, and now I say that with some research uh, that I'll share with you. Well, one thing, one of the more innovative things, the city of Atlanta has said if you live, if you're doing a development within a half a mile of a MARTA station, your parking requirement is zero. You can actually build a high rise in Atlanta with next no summer with zero parking. That's now, is anybody doing it? The market forces are still there that say, hey, we may need some parking. You know? So the, what but, you're saying but is you're the not, guy building that investment is yeah. going to say, I can't lose customers because they can't park. Yeah. But now I'll, I'll give you another example, though. A good friend of mine, a uh, developer here in Atlanta that's developed throughout the country, uh, Richard Aronson, he did a project in Chicago and it was in a hot new area where they're taking an industrial area and, and turning it into kind of a high end uh, living in a restaurant place, you know, meat packing district in Chicago. Wow. Basically, it used to be meat packing, now you can go have a dinner and the Brussels sprouts are 80 bucks. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so, 
But he his project wouldn't have worked financially if he provided the amount of parking that they required. So he, but he was, Chicago's built up enough, and the bank understood it. They they did exactly what you were talking about. They surveyed all the apartments in the area and how many spaces were empty, and they showed that data to the bank and the bank Jeez. and and, the, and they said, hey, you don't you don't need to build that much parking. That helped his financing work to get the project going. So it's important that we don't build too much of this stuff. So uh, like take a city like Roswell, they feel like they got a parking problem. Really, all I see is they, that they have is Canton Street. Yeah. And, you know, they got a new development going up. It seems like they kind of wouldn't pass the development. The guy wouldn't build a parking deck, which the city's probably going to use. I don't know. But does the city of, does the city of Roswell say, for instance, do they need more parking decks? Like Alpharetta put in two parking decks, and they're filling up on a pretty regular basis, it looks like. Um, you know, you... They can have, here's where parking decks How do you help. determine that, I guess yeah. is what I'm saying. So we got hired to do a parking study for Norcross because okay. they, they were convinced they needed to do a parking deck. I think they still are. But we counted the number of spaces they had, the uses they had, and how many spaces were vacant. And they didn't need to build a parking deck. It was a $2 million question. And he said, you really just need to landscape from this and signage from this nice parking you got over here that isn't used after hours, like the city hall and show them how they can get downtown, which is only a block and a half away. So and everybody park, thinks they, they need to down. park right in front. So shared parking is a big, so you have to, if everybody has to provide their own parking, it's not going to work because they're, unless they're using their space 24 seven, right? Mm-hmm. You're not maximizing your parking. So, so you can do studies to say, Hey, look, if you just change your rules and the, the, this is another favorite rule that, uh, to fix the parking. I, th- I don't know if you guys have done it here or not, but I tell a lot of cities like this, and they, they're they going to run me out of town. But they still hire me. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so you really want to fix your parking problem on your main street. Just put some put some meters out there. Because what happens, the store owner that's complaining, they don't, they, that, you know, they don't have enough parking. Mm. Which they do. They, they're parking in front of their own store and stopping their customer from parking there. And you find if you meter a space, not only you can take that money and put flowers everywhere to beautify the place, right? right? You can beautify the main street. Um, you can tell the business owners that's exactly what we're going to do with it, right? We're going to we're going to make this attractive. Um, but also, that counts as four spaces because it'll flip. If you want somebody wants convenience, they pay for it. Otherwise, you go around the corner. There's a space to park. What I do like about decks, I'm I'm can be an anti deck there for a minute. What I like about decks, if you took the six story parking deck that Alpharetta built and said we're going to do surface parking you wouldn't have a downtown it'd just be a big parking lot (laughs) and you wouldn't even need that so the ratio of land you know when you can stack the parking when you definitely provide on-street parking makes it safer for the pedestrian to you know that that saves a lot of asphalt if you had to have a road with no cars on it and then you have to build a parking lot separate from that you're wasting asphalt you're you're hurting the environment so would Alpharetta have worked without the parking decks it wouldn't be the same. No, it wouldn't It'd be, be the same. different. So the parking deck. You wouldn't have as much buildings. Because so, it gives you it gives you the ability just, to put stuff It's a simple, close. man. It's like pancakes, right? You got you got six pancakes, so those are your parking deck, right? Well, you're going to have to lay those pancakes out to get the same number of parking. So does a city like Roswell need a parking deck or not, in your opinion? I haven't done the study. I mean, sometimes I would ask questions like that to people yeah. when I was younger, yeah. and they said, that's a $25,000 question. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we won't go there. <laughs> So, but, you know, I would say, I, right, Roswell I live by, right? So I lived over in East Cobb for a long time. Now I live near the Braves and the river. But uh, I would say they could probably use one. What, if I were them, I'd look at tucking one in and then building. If you go down that great little main street they got in Canton Street, and then you hit a big surface parking lot. Well, that, that stops the rhythm, right? You, you don't have any of those problems because you've got your parking tucked in a deck in the back right yeah. but all your main street connects and you go from one shop to the next so you can hide so I'd the build decks. them a little deck back in the hole back by the brewery somewhere yeah and you could do valet parking that's gonna be a whole nother story but but anyways if you do that um and then you could build on that surface parking lot you know and you could build some you could build some nice mm-hmm. shops and some more restaurants there'd be more to do in that little downtown that was built you know for the population that was here in 1890 probably would serve the population that wants to all be right, there. So why I go to ball ground? It's hot. All of a sudden, ball ground's cold. That's popping. 
Mm-hmm. How do you take a, something that's nothing and make it start popping? What's what's the first key to that? One of the things I and I haven't been to ball ground recently. I was studying one of their developments. I like was built right next to a church and. Uh, um, but the, the thing, is it food? Is it retail? Is it housing? <laughs> Those are good. Those are all really good. All right. So, so the, the main thing is you got to create a place. This is the place a people want to be. A sense of place. A sense of place. And how, and but, what's uh, but the... now a sense of place, let's think about that. A sense of place. Can you live there? Right. All right. So housing is really important. Housing. I mean, I remember, I won't say your name, but when I first did that, Alpharetta master plan, I had a lot of housing down here. And they said, who's going to want to live downtown? Right. <laughs> that was your community yeah, development, I right? I know you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> My dad had Bless, her out. Ha- Bless her heart. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I think it's proved out that people want to live here, and that, that, makes, that gives it life. So housing's really important. Kennesaw took off. They did two, they did two things. They took an old gas station guy that wouldn't sell, right? And it was falling apart. They said, just let us lease it. You want to own it? This is a downtown development. Just let us lease it. We'll fix it up. We'll find a tenant. They fixed it up, got a really good chef to do a chef restaurant. had a, ro- a rooftop, you know, a venue on Made top it of it. a cool spot. Yeah, it's called Trackside. I go check out. Great, great chef, master chef. So food attracts people. So you're, you're talking about housing. Food attracts people. Well, then a housing developer came in and said, because that restaurant's there, I'll build an apartment complex with retail on the bottom floor right across the street. The two go together. And, of course, because you have that, now the restaurant works. And that's why I was going back to, like, the city of Roswell's worried that they're losing their retail, but they don't want any more apartments. So I see, you know, people in apartments go out to eat more than people in single-family homes with that big Mac Daddy kitchen. <laughs> so, that's a great so, point. So, so sometimes you gotta you got to do a little bit of what you don't want to get what you do want. But to create a place... It also is design. To us, it's in particular, it, uh, public, it does take public investment. That was one thing Alpharetta for years when I did the master plan thought the private sector would come in and do it for mm-hmm. them. No, it doesn't work that way. The public sector often has to make the first move and they have to do it at a really high quality because the private sector naturally is not going to build to a standard that's not already there. Right? They, Unless they're, they don't, they're trying to cut their risk. They're right? cutting their risk, right? So if you want to up the game in your town, you need to put in the infrastructure of the public sector. You need to build some really high quality places and the, and, and, and the private sector will flock. So like if you and I... Not got, above your market, but you need to... You yeah. Know. So I go through all these small towns in Georgia and they're dried up. Yeah. If, if, if somebody said, hey, Bill, you can... You can take this town, and, and we need your help to make this town start popping again. Is is And you need a sense of place is the first thing. But a sense of place can be a new cool restaurant, right? Yeah. Or a new cool hotel, or what is it? What's the first most major piece that you got to have? Because I think about these little dried-up towns all over the country, and how could you get them going again? I mean, yeah. Do you ever think about that? Yeah, I, you know... I see a lot of those towns from my trail rides, mm-hmm. and my it's interesting about my trail rides. All those towns uh, have seen a lot of economic development because they created a place for the uh, cyclists to stop. So that started. So that's one thing. It is okay. not always, but it, you need to build on the infrastructure that's there. Uh, I will tell you all these. I will tell you all these small towns are about to see uh, a lot happen. Right. They're fixing to happen again. Yeah, and but here's the first thing, and it's not it's not my business, but it's business they need to be in. They need to have, they need to have the technology. They need to have the, the five uh, G network. Because people with the pandemic has proved we can work anywhere. We can. so these small town. I mean, what surprised me about the uh, projects that I'm working on now would be considered ex urban way out. Mm-hmm. People are flocking to them. Just like a Cartersville's now cool. Yeah, yeah, something. Cartersville. I've got one in Brasselton, um, yeah. way up in um, Forsyth County, which is not so way up anymore, mm-hmm. right? Uh, that's just hot as it, hot as can be. Uh, you still want to create a great walkable environment up there, but you got to have the fiber optics. You got to. Well, what have about the, a city like Cumming though? They did they screw their square up by putting all those those government buildings? I mean, they had a little square and they had some government buildings, and then they tore some of it down and. People like it doesn't have a sense of place. Yeah, that's that's the same thing as just having office buildings, right? What are the government buildings used? 
right? Yeah, just during the day. It's dead. It's dead. Well, well unless you get arrested by the sheriff, you probably go into the jail. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Hateville's way. I mean, a lot of cities are, every city's different. We planned Hateville. All right, Hateville, they have a ton of great restaurants. Funky atmosphere, got a great uh, brewery. Um, but most of the restaurants close, are closed for dinner. You know why? They got a daytime population of 50,000. Everybody's working at the airport at right. Delta. And they got a nighttime population of about 5,000. You know, so, so. Not enough customers. So it's a different problem down there, right? Because now they need people living there. Yeah, they need more people living there. So that's there. what you're basically saying. So it depends. It's you got to get the data. It's the, yeah, you got to get and the you, data. Do you have enough workers or do you have enough <laughs> retail or do you have enough housing? I will enough? tell you, though, the arts are really important. You mentioned the arts. And I never want to forget culinary arts. I mean, when you mention restaurants, good food will draw people a long way. And um, they did a study in 2016 before the pandemic. In, in America, we were spending more money for the first time in restaurants than we were in grocery stores. Mm. Now, the pandemic hurt that a little bit, but coming out of the pandemic, the restaurants are booming again. People just, it's just want to be out. They just want to be out. And we're making money right now. Yeah. Most and we, and we, you know, money. my generation didn't grow up with a lot of good options. Uh, and there's so many good culinaries and artists, man. <laughs> I'm coming back up here Saturday to go to smoke, you know, the barbecue joint yes, downtown. Smoke. Meet, meet with somebody. Hey, I'm, I'm Dave, thinking about it all week. <laughs> but, but Dave was there before anybody. <laughs> You know, he was the main guy down there forever, yeah. and we kept yeah. thinking that was going to happen. And then when it finally happened, it was such a blessing for him. But other, it, I, I think that's a, something a lot of people don't understand. If you got a retail store, you want to be, be be near other retail stores. If you got oh, a yeah. restaurant, you want to be near other restaurants, right? So they yeah. draw on each other like that mall. Yeah, there, sort of. there's a critical mass, and it's not as much as people think, but you need to have it. You need to have about... 600 feet of retail, about 80,000 square feet, and that's almost independent of the size. Say right. that again? About 600, 600 lineal feet uh -huh. to make a main street. 600 and, lineal feet. And about 80,000 square feet. And 80,000 square re, feet. Of retail. Did you get that out of the pattern language? Might have. Hey, y'all, if y'all haven't <laughs> ever read this book and you kind of like planning and stuff and how cities and all work. I ran into this book. I forgot who gave me this book. I, he was the first guy I called. I said, hey, man, you ever seen this book? He said, I think I read it back in college or something. That was me. And then he went and got it. And <laughs> um, this is, this is, you know, how do you plan your garage? You know, I mean, yeah, it's I crazy. It's how do you do, your, what's the proper size for your garden and stuff? So how do you plan an office? You should read that chapter. It's unbelievable. And what he said that for an office, you ought to have different work environments a lot like a house. And now everybody's working out of their house. Yeah. And he describes a house in, in the, the ideal like office. Like the 60s, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, you have places where you can sit at a table, places where you can go in private, places where you can commune together. And he would basically said you should design your house, your office like a house. That's just an and I'm crazy. reading this during the pandemic, and I was like, well, I guess you know, I guess he was a little ahead of the guys on, on on his time. <laughs> him and him and Olmstead. But the other one I tell people to read now too is because uh, we have. I'm not a big, you know, I'm not Mister. I'm not selling apartments, right? You don't you don't need to be doing apartments everywhere. Um, they are easier to finance. They do pay for the redevelopment because they pay a lot for the land. And there's a huge demand. But forget that. People are just tired of all these, you know, like Shambly. And I don't want to, the mayor Shambly. Yeah, Buford friend, Highway. And they just get four-story apartments down their whole <laughs> corridor. And uh, mayors are saying, how mayors are winning elections saying, I'm going to stop that. Right? Right. And so the, the answer to that is something interesting. And it's a new book I, I've been recommending everybody read called Missing Middle. A colleague of mine out in California was dealing with those issues. And he would take elected officials into San Bernardino and they would look at houses, they would look at these little buildings and say, I want one of those, I want one of those. Then he'd come back and say, you know, those are all little apartment buildings, little courtyard apartment. They're only two or three stories, maybe 12 units, mm -hmm. totally different unit next door, but they're apartment buildings and you can get local equity. You or me can own one of those. If you take, you know, you talk about social equities, instead of moving people out, teach them how to own one of those. Then they become invested in the community. Hmm. Then they want to, you know, as opposed to some REIT in New York or some is coming down financing a big apartment deal. They don't live here. They don't care about right. the community. So you get local ownership in it. And, because and, they're smaller. But, they're, but everybody wants those buildings. Yeah, they're, they're smaller. smaller. They're smaller. Yeah. They're designed. 
You know, they got little courtyards and fountains, yeah. and the people want to live in them. Porches. Grant Cordon, I don't know if you ever read any of his stuff. He's huge on that. He's trying yeah. to get people to buy these small apartment complexes. Yeah. The rental we, income we have, is fast, fantastic. So I've, a friend of mine, you introduced me to John Gatz, and we're building something like that for him in the phase two. It's a little missing mill of building. So when is apartments bad, and when are apartments good? Because I think— Too much. <laughs> it's too much in one area. Is yeah. it about spreading it out, which is really kind I think, of the key? You know, key? You, what people don't say in, in our in our finance laws and the the financing strap of our kids today um, make it hard for ownership. Mm-hmm. But there's a difference when you own your own, and so when you do an area that's nothing but apartments, and you get up, you know, it gets that, to be your trashy place first. It does. I mean, I remember working years. in uh, the, it, with Marietta. They wanted me to master plan the Franklin Road area. That's where all their crime was. And it was all apartment after apartment after apartment after apartment. And the number that, the numbers that the apartment guys, the big apartment guys need to make work are 250 to 350, you know? So if you're doing a development, you allow two to 350, it'll-, it'll Units. Help. Yeah, 250 to 350 units. And then, but put in some ownership stuff next to it. You I mean, it doesn't have to be in that building, but make Mix sure you've got, a, you've got somebody that's invested that's local that's going to vote for you in office, right? So you got to mix in enough home ownership and you got to make, you got to have a range of that, that ownership. I don't know. I think we did a lot of things successfully in, in Alpharetta and y'all have done a lot of things, but is it affordable? You know, have we done it before? I mean, the apartments are all people like me. And you, you know, there's there's right. thirty five hundred a month to live in. <laughs> right. So we so apartments aren't mean you're. When is an office building too big or too small? That's a really good question. So I, I master plan downtown Milton, then I get hired by a, a, a really good developer. He's built buildings in Rosemary Beach and and uh, and and uh, they. Uh, this is Milton, downtown Milton, and I re- I did the master plan. Other firms were hired after me to do the coding of it. And they said a building couldn't be more than 25,000 square foot foot on a floor. And uh, there was this gaming, high-tech gaming company, Roswell, that was booming. Most of the guys lived up in Crab Apple. Technology, all high-paying jobs, people inventing these uh, games. And they wanted, they wanted to move to downtown uh, Milton. But they wanted everybody on one floor, and it was 40,000 square feet. Mm. And we even designed two buildings that were attached by a bridge. They loved it, right? Right. But the interpretation of that code killed the deal. So isn't that exactly what you'd want in your town center is a bunch of, you know, entrepreneur technology. High tech entrepreneurs who live there. there. Who live there. So so it's more about the way the scale of the thing looks, right? Um, So how much is too big, you know, for a human environment? Here's a good rule. And I, I was struggling with this rule a little bit in College Park, but they had a. If you're if you're designing a car environment, the roads are every mile to the crossroads, every mile to maybe six blocks or maybe a 600 feet, right? If you want an environment where people can walk, the the block should be no more than two to 400 feet. So that's one of the first things when I get in there draw. Instead of thinking about roads, I think about cells, and that cells the block, you know. And, and that block and those dimensions can't be more than two to 400 feet. So that begins to set the biggest size of a building you can have. Because if you, then if you do, all right, I got a 400 foot block, but I want a really nice streetscape. So you got 20 feet for trees and parking right. cars before you get to it. You so that 400 back. feet becomes, you know, it's not a 50 foot front yard setback, but there's, you know, each side of the block's got yeah. 20 feet. So you take 40 feet out of it. Then you got a building that's, you know, 360 feet long. And that, even that's too big of a building. You want to break it down so it gets into the human architectural scaling of a building. How can you break that into two or three different components? There, there was a rule, you know, these charming downtowns, they don't they change about every 25 feet. So if you think about so that. A front, but it could be the same building. The facade is <laughs> yeah. changing every 25. Not okay, that you have to do that to be successful because people like old mill buildings, right? They just have a nice rhythm. But that's to the it. same distance yeah. basically as a townhome or a row house, yeah, right? Yeah, it is. It is. So that number really well. stays, stays, stays <laughs> yeah. consistent. In Smyrna, we did, we did some of the first mixed use, and it was 25-foot town, wide townhomes. They parked in the back, but the bottom was retail. And instead of doing a 60-foot deep retail, we turned the retail this way. So one store had a lot of glass. You had the garages in the back, and it was only 25 feet deep. 
and you had you know four tenants, the main street was done. <laughs> so in your mind, what's the ultimate planned place if you had to go somewhere and tell somebody this is this is the ultimate? Where is that? Paris? Paris is nice. Um, I spent some time in Rome. That was nice. Um, How about the UK with the villages and the countryside and then the village? Yeah. I, I think one thing they got right in, in Europe is they didn't uh, sprawl all over the place. So they created villages and connected them by rail. That's so cool. Yeah. And so you have the countryside. To me, is that you, at places that have the countryside and have the urban living, that kind of have a mix of it, are really, really the nicest places. I mean, I'm a big. I mean, it's funny. I well, was, used to be a fan of. Says used, you got to have some green. You got to be close. I to I would green say a, a place that's also unique to itself. So it's hard to pick one. I mean, when I went to Austin, it struggled some areas of urban planning. But they what they had going for there was this huge river that went through town, and they made a whole greenway system out of it. And I'm on that river, and all of a sudden, there's a statue of Stevie Ray Vaughan, who basically got started there. That's a sense of place, right? Yeah. It was pretty cool. I said, this is a cool place. <laughs> but San Antonio's got the river walk. Yeah, San, yeah, water is really good. It's hard to say. Man, because I'm one of those architects that... Do uh, you see the beauty in each one kind of really is what you're saying? I see the beauty, but if you ask me my favorite place, it's yeah. getting on top of a mountain and skiing. There's not a building around. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what we... We can't plan. Well, I guess you can plan to not have buildings, right? S Savannah. You know, think locally, Savannah's Savannah. a pretty good plan. Charleston's a pretty good plan. Um, there's a scale issue sometimes. I really get tired of New York. I mean, last time I was at New York... I thought they upped their game. You know, it's just so dense, right? So there is mm -hmm. a density limit. Um, but they've started greening New York and the High Line and made those pedestrian-friendly environments. I, I think those en environments that you're in that you don't feel stressed out, right? Mm -hmm. There's not six lanes of traffic next to you. You can smell the, the, the foliage around. Uh, there's shade, you know. And, and those are the, you know, you think about Charleston would be one place. But... Uh, Nantucket was really nice. You ever been up to Nantucket? Mm -hmm. um, parts. Of I didn't like it. I, the traffic was so atrocious. I had to, <laughs> I had to make a U turn and get the hell out of there. It was terrible. <laughs> I just I said I can't do it. I'm out of here. And uh, we went we went by Plymouth where the Plymouth Rock is. Yeah, we actually liked Plymouth. There wasn't, there wasn't anything going on. It was just a rock, though, right? Just there. a little bitty rock. <laughs> so what? Um, I mean, when you're when you're thinking about how you do what you do, do you do you feel like you have certain confidence level on certain things and not on others, or do you feel fairly confident, or do you feel like I'm going to grow confidence by getting the data that I can help make decisions? How do you work through that? Because eventually you're going to be standing in front of people and you're going to be saying, "Hey guys, this is what I think you need to do." Where does that come from? You know, it's weird, but uh, some people tell me architecture is an old man's profession, and, you know, I'm in my early 60s. And, uh, you know, my, my siblings would say, how's it going? How's it been? And, you know, I said, you know, architecture's kind of like breathing now. <laughs> I've been doing it so long. I don't know where. Just... It, it's it, it kind of like people that write music, too. It's like, how'd you write that song? I just kind of came, you know. I've been writing songs for so long, it just came. You just kind of be open. You really got to stay open to the, the context and the moment. Um, but also, if you've been doing it so long, you made you probably made a few mistakes, and you've been burned a few times, and you learn. You just you, learn. You but getting in front worked of, and what didn't. Yeah, getting in front of a crowd is pretty easy for me. But it, but it's probably because of twenty years of doing the wrong thing. I know, you know, I just right. naturally know what I want to say. What, <laughs> but uh, I, you know, I'm I'm also as an entrepreneur, you got to be somewhat fearless. You know, you, right. you you know, so I'm not afraid to to take a chance. Are you I'm learning doing. new stuff? You think all the time, all the time. That's 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 the, probably the funnest uh, thing is is keep keep growing and keep learning. And you know, it was like designing a marina town. There's a lot of rules around a marina. I've never designed a marina town, right? That is so I cool. just get into it. I, and, and you said, do you know every? I don't know everything. It's bringing the right experts. A marina town, you better have some people in there that have run marinas, know how to operate marinas, know how they make money, know how they great, great places, know what works. So you bring a team, 
right? And you listen, you listen, you listen, you challenge, you ask questions, you say, well, because some things that work for the marina wouldn't work for the pedestrian. So we, we moved a whole um, area where they get the boats out because yeah. they were cutting off a whole side of the marina that could be condos and retail, but it was going to be nothing but forklifts and boats, you know? Well, and so we moved it to one side. That's so cool. That, you that's know. cool, yes. Yeah, but, so, uh, but I had to understand. But you're not afraid to tap into people that you think are smarter than you in a particular Oh, yeah. Area. Yeah, the, and like that retail expert, I mean, we would bring him into jobs. The market analysis guy, we bring other people in. Talented landscape architects I work with always make a difference, you know. So it's, it's always um, a collaborative process. Do you think a lot of people are scared to do that? They kind of want to be the guy, and they're not willing to bring other people in and, and do that? I would say in my uh, earlier career I was like that. You know, I, I, you know, architects, you have to have a little bit of an eagle to do it. Mm -hmm. But as you, you know, and I don't know if you want to put this in the recording or not, but as you... As you uh, as you get uh, as a young architect, I thought the only good architect was the dead architect because they weren't competition. Right. So I would honor people like Louis Kahn, Frank Lloyd Wright, all these famous architects. They're great. You want to know what great is? You know, either hire me or think about one of them. It's much different. There's a lot of good architects out there. There's a lot of good planners out there, and you know, there's there's firms we compete with all the time on the planning basis. But they do some. They do a different part of it a little better than us, and we do a different part. We tend we tend to be the people that come in there and are really good at design. Other people may be really good at writing all the codes and regulation, you know. Mm -hmm. But if you want to create a people a place that people love, that's us, right? So that's your buzz. Yeah, it's our buzz. We want to create the place. And, Call and, and more group. They're going to have yeah. you find a and place. And we're people architect to planners, to. so we'll come in there and plan it, but we'll also do the architecture and create the whole environment. And we don't always have to do that. Again, you know, sometimes other people plug in and do that piece. Right. And that would upset some firms. Like, if I'm going to plan it, I want to do the architecture. That doesn't matter to us. We know we've had an impact. We know we've done the plan better than they could have, right? And if they get the architectural component and they do a lot of that building type, sure, you know, go ahead. So how do you figure out who you hire and who you fire? Uh, you know, we're probably blessed a little bit in Georgia Tech, and my uh, my uh, my office is close to that, and so we do get a lot of students from Georgia Tech. But I would say number one is attitude. You know, how do you do that? How do you figure out an attitude when a conversation or whatever? That's a really good question. You you know, it. I can't say you sense it, but um, you go on gut a lot. It gets dangerous. You know, we do do some psychological testing and teaming, but I do, you know, most entrepreneurs work on gut. Do uh, a lot of multiple interviews with other people? Do multiple interviews, but you also, you're constantly looking at what's missing on your team. And we do use cycle. I mean, I've got, I've got a psychologist on call. Yeah. You know, and they do, t you know, there's Myers-Briggs and all those things, but we, right. do, we use the Berkman. But you can kind of see, all right, this team, it's funny, I, I broke it into three teams. So I got a planning team. And I've got an interiors team, and I got an architectural team, and I put a leader in front of you know, in front of each one of them, right? And I let them do some of the hiring and attract some of the. They got to build their team, and I found what they did after we tested them all. It's like all the designers ended up in planning, all the technical people ended up over here, and all the, it was like they only hired people like themselves. Ah. And so I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, and we, you know, we had to. Have, you need somebody that's not like you. Because if I yeah. want to get a schedule out of all the creative people, it never comes out because they just want to create, right? Right. You need somebody that's a little more analytical. So, so some of it's not it's it's the right person, but it's the right mix. Right. You know, it's the right mix on a team. So, did you bust them up a little bit? Yeah, I've got them. Yeah, I got to let them see the light, and I would mix them up like that to make sure they had. That's, you know, that's some, awesome. Yeah, it's it's important. People are the. The main thing, and you want it to feel like family. And the beef, the big thing, and we're going through it right now. Everybody's dealing with the mass exodus. I want people at our office. I want to be at our office. Right. If they're just you looking like for the a, people being at the office. Do you like what we do? Right. Yeah. If you don't like what we do, don't work here. You know. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> and see, I do think you, is there a re or I like what you do, but I can add something that's even better. Right? Right. But I think that's a boss thing, right? You and I as bosses, we want people around us. We want to do, touch them and talk to them and move. But there's a certain set of employees I'm beginning to believe is they don't feel that same way. They're just, no. they're, it's a job. For us, it's a passion and a purpose. No, they want, in my industry, they want to create a union, you know? There's an architect's union now. 
<laughs> it, it's, it's funny. It's funny. And you can't find people that want to take ownership as much. So finding people that want to take ownership, you know, that want to take ownership of what they do, take pride in what they do, but also want to be part of the family and want to contribute, right? And also for us, because we work in communities, we like people that like getting involved in the community, want uh, to contribute to the community, want to be a part of it. Um, you know, so, I, you know, and it, for, for another weird thing about us, it just, and it became a core value after I realized we were doing it. Uh, every one of my leaders I was telling you about is female and it wasn't intentional. Um, That's interesting. Wow. But, and then, and then my, I'm the CEO, but my president's female is from Puerto Rico. And uh, one of my leaders uh, is African American. And so I said, you know what really fuels this company is diversity. And I realized that, you know, that, you know, that's, and I started researching that. And they said, yeah, really monocultures don't produce anything innovative. Which is back when to you, the groups you had. Everybody's yeah, alike, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, you really don't want all neurotypicals in a room. You want somebody with autism in a room. Neurotypicals. What the hell is that? All right. So now, so you talk about diversity. The new, the, my new interest. My education level is not as high as yours. <laughs> my new interest. Well, I, uh, neuro. Neurotypical. You neuro. need neuroatypicals. All right. So all right. you watch Big Bang? No. All right. So anyways. So <laughs> there's a lot of people in our society that live on the autistic spectrum. Okay. Right. And are uh, challenged in certain areas, neuro neurologically challenged. Their brain is different, right? Okay. So I know we, we know we spend a lot of time talking about the color of the nationality, but it's really how people think that's important, right? right? And um, and you need to create environments that it, that that are open to somebody that thinks differently than you, right? Right. And and just these, their brains are wired differently. You can go fa farther, they, faster. They, one of the, my favorite uh, presidents of all time is Thomas Jefferson. Read a book about him. He, they're ninety nine point nine 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 percent sure he had autism, and and he created our constitution. So you need people that think differently, mm -hmm. right? And so, so um, in, in those environments, um, where I've got a uh, client in Tennessee that I just got a real uh, um, big heart for. He's got a severely autistic child. I mean, I've been, it was like the movie Beautiful Mind when I went to their house and saw what she did with her room that painted all over the place. And uh, he uh, put her in a, um, a, a, he tried to put her in a Christian school in uh, Clarksville, Tennessee, and they couldn't, they couldn't accommodate her special needs. And so he went to another Christian school that was just getting started, and they said, sure, we'll, we'll take her on. And so they created a program. He got on their board. They created a program that would allow kids like that to, to flourish. And um, that school now is, they hired a guy from Disney to run it. That school is now bigger than the other school. That school is now winning state championships. They're poaching Christian coaches from around the country. And now he's hired me to build a whole town, put the expansion of the school in the middle of the town, and make everything for Nero atypicals to feel at home. So he's, he said to me, Bill, if I want to take my daughter to the to the movie, to the movie theaters, I got to rent out the whole movie theater. So when we're designing a performing arts center, a movie theater, that a family with a neuroatypical child could go and enjoy. And it's really, it's really like having a box seat in the back you know, with glass, but they can go to the show where everybody else is. So that's, that's a whole there, and that's the second project I got hired to do something like that. I did one up in Cherokee. It's a different world. And then when I was talking about those cottage courts, so how do you design a neighborhood for people like that? And we put in this thing, we got a, we, they can build $600,000 homes all they want. Clarksville, Tennessee, who would know it? And right. you know, that, they's got, that's what they do for a living. They, he's a contractor, developer, financer, great guy, <laughs> third generation contractor. And they could take that whole farm, 450 acres that we planned this town on, and just built a bunch of $600,000 homes. Instead, we're putting a school in there, we're putting a church in there. And we're putting a YMCA in there, and we're putting an apartment building, we're putting a town center and a main street in there. And he is still going to have a section for the $600,000 homes, but he got a section for teachers too, so they can afford to live there. And then he's got another section for the neuroatypical. And how do you design that? Well, we got it right next to the nature center where you have horses, because horses help with hippotherapy. But also, we have that cottage court concept where all the homes open up to a green. And then, but it, the thing you have to add, you have to add fencing on that so the kids don't run out. This, her, her daughter knows, his daughter knows how to pick locks and she can just run out, right? 
and they live with this every day. I mean, every day. I did most of the design work in their dining room table because they have to watch their daughter. I mean, it, that's that's their life. Yeah. So I mean, twenty four seven. We think people have problems, you know, but yeah. But that's he's special. he's given so much back, and how do you design environments that it can accommodate those kind of things? So All right, guys. I hope y'all enjoyed our time with with my buddy Bill. And uh, if you're looking to build your own city, call Bill. He'll come <laughs> lay it out for you just like you want it. So thank you, Bill. Appreciate Thanks. you being here. Appreciate you inviting me. Thanks for the bird. All right. Thanks for another <laughs> episode of Beach Talks. <laughs>